name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ is risen. He is risen. Today, beloved Christians, we have a great blessing to talk about and to magnify the holy virtue of courage. It's a very important virtue. It's a timeless virtue. Courage is a virtue that every culture has lauded throughout history. Even the earliest poems we have, we go to the Iliad, we go to the Odyssey, all of them glorify courage. It's a great virtue. It's a great thing. It's something very praiseworthy. Aristotle, the well-known philosopher, said, Courage is the first of all human virtues because it makes all others possible. This was his opinion. Plato, a very well-known philosopher, the teacher of Aristotle said this, he said, Courage is a special kind of knowledge, the knowledge of how to fear what ought to be feared and how not to fear what ought not to be feared. That's a very interesting quote because it doesn't go far from Christ's words, in which he says, Do not fear those who may kill the body, but fear him who will burn the body and the soul in hell, if he judges it. Know what you should fear and what you should not fear. So Plato says something very interesting here. But today we speak of Christian courage, and courage is a hard thing because courage can have many motivators, right? There are some men who will be courageous because they want to be well seen by others. You know, they said in the Civil War men would endure horrendous things because they did not want anyone to think they were yellow. In fact, there was men who would walk into hails of bullets because they said, I do not want my honor to be impugned. So he did not want any man to think less of him. There are other men who can do very courageous things because they're enraged because they're so full of a desire for vengeance that they do not care anymore what will happen to them. In fact, there's a Welsh proverb that says, anger and courage are equal in a fight. If a man is angry, he is well, just as he, if he was courageous. So courage is not, does not always stem from virtuous places. It doesn't always stem from, from good, from good, from good um, roots. But what about the courage we speak of today? Today we speak of real Christian courage, a courage that stems from something greater. When we think about Nicodemus and Joseph, who bore murder to Christ, they anointed him on the day that he had died. We can say that they were not motivated by anything but love. Both of these men are not particularly brave, because when we read about them in the scriptures, they did not follow Christ out of principle. At least, not at the beginning. They followed him, but they would not stand on their principles. They did so by night. Nicodemus would only visit Christ at night, because he was a man of great reputation. He was a teacher of the law. And if he had spoken with Christ, he would have lost it. He would have lost his reputation in his place. So he would come to speak with Christ, and he would speak to him at night, and he loved what he said, and he was converted. And if you read John 7, Christ goes up to Jerusalem on the Feast of Tabernacles, and he begins to preach. And this creates a huge firestorm. Many people are worshiping him, they glorify him, they listen to him, and others are going to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are saying, this man is not of God. And at the end of the whole discourse, Nicodemus, Nicodemus he stands up and he says, can our law judge a man before he knows what he says? He's not really defending Christ intensely, he's just slightly doing it. You can tell he's already been converted. As soon as he says this, the Pharisees turn on him and they snap. They say, are you also from Galilee? Has any prophet come from Galilee? Search the scriptures, there is none. Of course, they're wrong. The prophet Jonah was from Galilee. The point being is that they immediately descend upon him. They immediately smack him. Badly. So even for just saying this, Nicodemus is smacked. As for Joseph, we don't know much about Joseph of Arimathea, because he only appears at the end of the scriptures, at the end of the Gospels. And when he appears, he acts bravely, though it's said that he followed Jesus secretly. So he was like Nicodemus, he wouldn't follow him openly. Because Joseph was also a man of high station, and if he had followed Christ openly, he would have lost his station. He would have lost everything. When a man is proud, he cares about what men think. I guarantee you, Nicodemus, neither him nor Joseph cared much for the Romans. They didn't care what the Romans thought. They cared only what their fellow Jews would think. And as soon as they anointed Jesus' body, they gave up any hope they would ever have esteem from those men again. The moment that Nicodemus pulled out the spice and began to anoint Christ, the moment that Joseph gave him his own tomb, that's what it says in Matthew, that he gave him his own tomb, the tomb he had set aside for himself. Joseph identifies with Christ more closely even than his disciples seem to at this moment. As soon as these two men do this, they're done. They don't have a reputation anymore. It's their love that drives them to act this way. Is Nicodemus watching and listening to Christ, speaking with him, seeing what he is like? 
and being overcome by his love, and then he acts, and it impels him at this moment. At the moment when Christ is so unjustly treated that he is murdered, Nicodemus cannot pull back anymore, he simply acts. At this point, he doesn't care anymore. Neither does Joseph of Arimathea. They don't care anymore. As for the women, they were courageous also, because they were going to anoint the body of one of the most hated men in Jerusalem. All of Jerusalem had risen against Christ. Where in the Gospel narratives do we hear one Jewish voice speaking in favor of Christ? We don't. The only one who seems to speak in favor of Christ is Pilate. He's the only one who wants to release him, and he crucifies him. So these women are going to anoint the body of one of the most hated men in Jerusalem at this moment. And this tomb is guarded by ferocious soldiers, by Romans who are not nice people. They're occupiers, and they are brutal men, men who kill for a living. And these women have no defense. And yet they go because they're so attached to Christ they're so indebted to him, they're so full of love for him, that what can they do except go to him? You have Mary Magdalene, who was taken out of massive sins. She had at least seven demons that the scriptures say were cast out of her. Some people, some of the Holy Fathers say she was a great prostitute. Not all the fathers say this. Some do, some don't. That's very controversial. But she was a person who had many sins, and the Lord raised her out of it. And so for her, there's nothing but Christ anymore. So she loves him, that's it. She's ready to do anything. And not only that, it's not just the Romans that are watching the tomb, you have to believe the Jews are watching it too, because the Jews have posted the Romans there. They've asked Pilate specifically, specifically for it. And they also want to see who's going to come and venerate, who's going to come to the tomb. And as soon as this person comes, we'll mark them down. We'll write down their names. Who's coming to the tomb? Who's going to come and see the body of Jesus? Who's going to do this? So these women are actually risking a lot. And being women, they don't really have much of a defense, and yet they go anyway, because of their great zeal, their great love. You see, courage is a very important virtue because... In Christianity, courage is the test of love. That's how we validate love. If a man has courage, true courage, it means that he loves something greatly. He's willing to take risks for it. He's willing to risk his life for it. That's what real courage means. So courage is necessary. It's a very necessary thing. When you look at the pagan virtues, the pagans spoke of wisdom, justice, courage, moderation. These are the four stoic virtues. These are good virtues. They're from God also. But the pagans did not have it all right you don't see love or humility mixed with them. And none of these virtues are tempered with humility or with love. Love is the defining factor. So Christians must have courage. They must have deep courage, because this is the test of their love. If you have love, you'll have courage also. The love of the Church gives us these readings, both last week's reading for St. Thomas and today's reading for the Verb Errors, because it's trying to show us what we should do after Pascha. So after Pascha, we just celebrated this, the church gives us the story of Thomas, and it says to us, believe it. Believe what you see, right? Believe it and, give, and have your hope in it. Have faith and hope in what Thomas has seen, in what he has touched. Christ truly is alive. Thomas has touched him. Thomas has seen his nail prints and was ready to put his fingers into his side. Believe it. Have faith in it and have hope in it. Today, they're not saying have faith or have hope. They're saying have love. Right? The three great virtues, faith, hope, and love, love is fulfilled today. Because now the church is saying, you have seen possible, now act like the myrrh-bearers. Act like Joseph and Nicodemus, and act like the holy myrrh-bearing women, including the mother of God, Mary Magdalene, Martha and Mary, and the others who went to Christ on this day. Emulate them. Have love. Have love. Let possibly lead you to faith, let it lead you to hope, and let it lead you to love. And may this love bring forth courage within you. May your love well up to courageous acts. Beloved, Pascha continues. We continue to celebrate it. We'll celebrate it until the leave taking of it before our ascension. We continue to cultivate faith, hope, love, and courage. Amen.